This week on a lively experiment, a special legislative session finally puts a wrap on the 2017 General Assembly. We speak with two representatives about the passage of one controversial bill. And Senators Reid and White House propose moving Election Day to the weekend. A lively experiment is generously underwritten by the Rhode Island Foundation, partnering with passionate Rhode Islanders to lead, transform, and inspire our state. Learn more at RhodeIslandFoundation.org. For 30 years, a lively experiment has been helping us understand the most important issues facing Rhode Islanders. Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr., and I'm proud to be a sponsor of this great program. Joining us on the panel this week, Pat Ford, chairman of the Rhode Island Libertarian Party, Kate Nagel, news editor at golocalprov.com, taxpayer advocate Lisa Blaze, and Democratic strategist Rob Horowitz. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Lively Experiment. I'm Jim Hummel. Thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. Well, it felt like old times up at the State House this week, a marathon session with bills flying back and forth, but this time with a well-rested legislators who arrived ready to wrap up loose ends from the session that ended abruptly in June. When the dust settled, the controversial sick time bill and gun control legislation that was years in the making passed, but a rumored override to the governor's veto of the Evergreen contract bill never happened. So Kate, as you well know from sitting there, you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> this seemed to go pretty much according to script. It did seem to go according to script. I mean, part of the fact was, as, as you mentioned, there was plenty of time for them to sort of hammer out the details. They sort of, I believe, knew what they were going into when they were there. Clearly, we knew that the sick time bill was a priority, especially of the progressive Democrats. Uh, we saw the compromise bill. As you said, we've got some footage of Minority Leader Morgan talking about the business community. So yeah, no punches pulled, no surprises. Um, I think all eyes now are on these hearings and what's going to happen with the Pawsox. We'll get to that in a minute. What do you think about the session? I think it's terrific that there was no override vote taken on the Evergreen contracts. That was actually going to be my kudos. Um, when Larry Berman, spokesperson for uh, Speaker Mattiello said there are no plans for an override vote. I thought the key word was plans <laughs> and that that was going to change. I think that was a fabulous move on behalf of taxpayers. It was going to be a huge overreach into the pockets of taxpayers and I'm thrilled that they did it and I hope they stick with that and do not revisit it this coming session. So the main piece of legislation I think that got the most discussion was the so-called sick time bill and there were changes going through it. This was uh, Representative Aaron Regenberg's bill and Mary Ellen Goodwin had a companion bill over in the Senate. Our senior producer Kim Keough sat down with both Representative uh, Regenberg and House Minority Leader Patricia Morgan who obviously have different views on this. Here's a little bit about on their thoughts about passage of this legislation. What the legislature did by passing this legislation I think is going to make a concrete positive difference in the lives of over a hundred thousand Rhode Island workers plus their families. It's going to let all of those people breathe a little sigh of relief knowing that that really painful choice between your health or your family's health and your job or your paycheck, to a large degree that can become a thing of the past. And I think that's, that's a big deal. I think we should feel some pride in Rhode Island that we're stepping up. We're saying that when a parent has to send their kid to school sick because they don't have any choice, when a family has to forego needed medical care because they can't afford to take a day off work, those are issues of basic human dignity and, and we should treat them that way in our public policy. I mean, it always sounds good. Let's, let's make sure everybody has sick days. Um, that's a nice goal. But I think first we have to make sure that our companies are strong enough to support that. It's a mandate on business. It's going to go up to five days a, a year for every employee to have sick leave. That cost, there's a cost to that. And not all of our companies are strong enough to do it. My feeling is if a company could do it, they would do it. If they can't, what we're doing is making them weaker. When you make them weaker, they have fewer jobs to offer to Rhode Islanders. I think it really depends on who you talk to. It's like, are we watching the same movie here? Because you, you, are we talking about the same legislation? This is phased into and it's exempted for businesses under a certain amount. Yes, it seems like a pretty good compromise. At the end of the day, we're talking about for the next couple of years, 
three sick days annually for a company, and folks who are more conversant can grow your own, a, a, a company that has 18 employees or more. If you're a smaller business than that, this doesn't apply to you, up to five days. So one week in a whole year of sick days seems reasonable. And, and I agree most companies, if they could do it, would, but not all companies, if they could do it, would. There, there is a reason for, for these kinds of common sense regulations. When we used to have a world um, where we had work days that were 80 hours, we had child labor. I'm not saying we're going back there either, but this, I, I understand some of the concerns about overregulation. This doesn't strike me as that. As a father of two, and also as an individual who myself and my spouse were fortunate enough to have sick days, I certainly empathetic and compassionate to those folks who don't. It's got to be a horrific choice between jobs and the welfare of your children. On the other hand, I wish the Rhode Island legislature spent as much time worrying about the actual underlying economy and the free market principles that we need to advocate to create a white hot economy than this type of issue first and foremost. I always point out that in Boston you have precious little conversation about minimum wage issues, you have precious little conversation about employee benefits because the economy there is so fundamentally strong. And by the way, this is just 30, 40 miles away, the beginning of the Boston economy, that you have out and out competition for good employees and as a result employers are forced to compete in part by offering the type of employee benefits that make this conversation so move. you don't have to mandate it it's there already it, the, the market forces it because again entrepreneurialism is alive and well in the city of Boston when the economy is hot um, employers are scrambling, especially small businesses, employers are scrambling to find great employees. And we all know that the basis of that is your benefit package to attract folks. Mm -hmm. So I have to agree with Pat. The last time I was on your show, maybe two times before, we talked about this and I said I wish that if they had to do something, it would be 50 or more employees, not grinding down the into guy. the level of the small guy. The mandate is an issue, and if we had a great economy, we wouldn't have to be talking about this. All right, you may not be keeping track, but the governor's people are that Governor Mundo's thousandth day, has it really been a thousand <laughs> no, days? it's coming up. It's coming up on October <laughs> 2nd. Don't jump the gun, Kate. <laughs> and uh, Kate, you guys actually had a great story about this. You got a, a yeah. hold of an internal memo. I get the feeling that Mike Rea should just buy a skirt and pom-poms yes. and go out there and be the cheerleader that he <laughs> is but they're really focused on this because they want to show what she's been doing they are focused and if you read the piece it's a pretty comprehensive memo of going to the directors and saying yeah. we want the good news basically mandating the good news and you know if you read it it seems quite overtly political and I think the backlash when people read the story was look there's so many problems that need to be cleaned up still yes you know cheer the winds but you hip, you hip, you hip, you know, when there's things that are, are consistently still needing to be resolved, it's kind of hard to rectify every department saying that we're doing stunningly. May I read one paragraph? Oh, please do. This is from your story. <laughs> In addition to the governor's events, we are asking every cabinet member to plan at least one event highlighting a specific and tangible ac accomplishment for these thousand days. Please copy and complete the form below <laughs> and get it back no later than four o'clock on September 8th, which is passed already. Well, so, okay, first thousand days. I just want to first point out the irony. Um, the article was fabulous in Go Local Prov, and I just want to quote, calls to the governor's press office regarding if this is campaign activity were not responded to. So to, to me that is just the hugest irony. As usual, the push for communication only travels in one direction out of Governor Raimondo's office. A couple other points I'd like to share. Chafee was indeed criticized for using an intern to video him and Gina is on steroids with our $61,000 uh, video operator. And last, next to last thought, yes. I'm wondering if the Rhode Island taxpayers want their money back because at least those that didn't sign up to have their taxes used to pay for public servants campaigning for Gina's re-election might want their money. And lastly, we're not supposed to be doing political work on state time. What about that? You, you've been in the political realm for years. Does this begin to cross the line or not? I think it's incredible, not to be overly sarcastic, I think it's incredibly shocking that an elected official is going to promote the things <laughs> that they think are good. That, that is what this communication structure that every governor and by the way, the president, Republican or Democrat, fair or unfair, that's what it's built to do. And, and here's, here would be my argument for it, because it's, your, and by the way, a great scoop by Go Local, so I'm, I'm not suggesting it wasn't. Um, but very much sort of day to day how this all works anyway, so it's good for people to see it, is the bias of news is to bad news. That's just conflict, right? It's what's going wrong, it's not what's going right. 
it wouldn't be bad every once in a while for people to hear about what's going right now. Clearly for the governor, it's a good thing to do. You want to promote, if whatever governor you are, whatever elected official are, you want to promote the things you think that are good. So we've got 364 days a year for the news to say, here's what's bad, you hub. Here's what's bad, these other things. There are some good things going on in Rhode Island. <laughs> it might be good to get some balance on it. Well, Did I hear laughing coming from this side? Yeah. If you notice, there hasn't been an overwhelming flood of substantial good news to back up the memo. Understand some, a fundamental aspect of Gina Raimondo. The taxpayers in the citizenry of Rhode Island are just a necessary inconvenience for her as she trods along on her path to bigger and brighter fields. We are nothing but a prop, a backdrop. So when she has to, and I use the term intentionally, trump up her, uh, her, her resume, basically on the backs of Rhode Island taxpayers, it's disgusting. Uh, again, where's the good news? Tell me something fundamentally being done correctly at any level on behalf of the taxpayers, philosophically, economically, socially, morally. There's no there there. No, I, have, I, have to, I have to agree with Rob and what he had to say with, yes, you want to have some good news. But if you are, to Pat's point, not fundamentally feeling good about this day, if right. you're not feeling good that you need services, that you're waiting in line for hours for, that if you're not feeling it in the wallet, you feel a certain disconnect. And we've talked about this before with, again, the national press versus the local press, you know, the governor getting the accolades on the national mm -hmm. level. It's how it resonates with the voters when they see this and they say, I'm not feeling good. Well, I, I, let me just say, I, I don't necessarily agree. that there, There's still, if you look at where it was from when we had Governor Chafee, the man who was in the State House in Louisville, governor, candidly, um, as governor, um, who was completely ineffectual, more people now think that the state's headed in the right direction. I mean, if you go out and really talk to voters, Gina Romano is very well positioned to be reelected. Her numbers are not bad. So I, that, that may be the media perception. That's not the perception, and I mean the perception of people who go up to the state house and testify and do do a good job like you folks, but that's not necessarily the perception of the average voters. There's a lot of good things going on here. The economy is doing much better. I, I know Pat and I will disagree about that. None of which this. has to do anything with Gina Romano. I don't agree with you. <laughs> I, mean, I, I tell, don't agree with you. Tell me, give me an example. I, I, I'll give you three or four examples. That, that, uh, one is CCRI. You may not like the free dislike or like the free tuition. I do. Um, Romans up 47 percent. If you want to look at economic right. development, that would be happening because it's free. Right. I mean, right. what, what's, the, what's the effect thing. on the actual institution economically in terms of course load? Are we doing nothing more than corporatizing CCRI? Has been alleged by professors at CCRI. I mean, you know, great congratulations. She's learned how to write a check to make herself look good at literally, literally and figuratively and, at the expense of the taxpayers. And also, I think that you, you don't know what's in her heart. Clearly, she's ambitious. That's not she a bad thing. That doesn't mean she's not motivated to do the right thing for the state. She's the individual who tried to tax medical cannabis. She tried to levy an exhaustive tax on the chronically ill and dying. I, I'm sorry, that's not a good thing. So, and that's, that's how you would hers. define her by that one act that you disagree with? I've got six or seven. I can go on so for hours. Everybody, and so can I. Even but without the ahead, details of, of what she's done right or done wrong in the eyes of anybody, it comes down, I think, to being genuine. And that's really where I was coming from with my remarks about this thousand day push. If our governor was out there on a daily basis uh, talking with the folks of the state, uh, in line with the people at UHIP, behaving in such a way that, that made people feel like she really did care, having one-on-one -on -one press conferences with the media, not behind a camera where we can be fluffed and puffed and, and edited to be presented in such a way, then I think that maybe this thousand day push wouldn't have gotten such a, a knee jerk reaction from me anyway. There is no genuineness coming from Gina. When she wants to speak good, she's packing a lunch and running from Wesley to Warwick. When she has issues, major issues, children in DCYF, UHIP issues, people who really cannot afford that 53% increase and doesn't jump into what can we do to turn this economy around for folks, then you start to look at that as fluffing your resume. And Kate, isn't part of it, look, we, we talked, one of the things we're going to talk about is they had the press conference with the Dreamers. Mm -hmm. So she can all of a sudden go out and get $170,000 in private contributions mm -hmm. and some of the national press was saying, oh, you know, Rhode Island, so they think it's taxpayer money. Right. But when it comes to you, Hip, there's not that personal touch. Exactly. There seems to be a disconnect. Well, again, it's, you know, there's only so many issues you can hit upon, but UHIP being such a large one. You know, again, the dreamers issue, again, energizing the base. The folks who really believe strongly behind it thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah. Gave more
more ammunition to the opposition saying, could you have spent this amount of time? And again, private money, now we've talked, <laughs> look to the press, it's Rhode Island raised this type of money, but again, it's, it's the positioning of picking and choosing the issues that look best from uh, an appearance standpoint from the administration. Precisely. I I, th I think you, know, you guys are harsh, harsh critics, by the way, I, um, which is fine. Um, I think if you look at the overall record, I think she's been our by f our best governor since um, since Bruce Sondland. I think she's got us on the right track on economic development. The economic numbers are good. Pat's going to say it's got nothing to do with her. We could have that argument. I think at the margins it does have to do with her. How many jobs she's got an actual strategy that, that that she's implementing, and. And on, and, and on the college thing, I, I think free tuition at CCRI for people, if you look at, at the reason why people drop out of college, one of the big, biggest reasons is financial pressure. That, that, that's scientific. She's, she's attempting to deal with that. And, and, and if she went out, by the way, and, and spent all the time with the folks, you guys would be here saying, she's spending all her time campaigning on these lines and not, and not doing the 24-7 job at the state. She has a different view of what needs to happen than you, than you folks. Don't you that think doesn't also make her either insincere or, or, you know, and we get great national press, and only in Rhode Island, great national press that helps us attract companies and the get great, more people that want to, let me finish for a second, completely. and gets people that, that, that want to come here. And what do we do here in Rhode Island? Oh, it's terrible. She's spending time getting great, we're getting great national press. That's good for the state. The, the great national good for her, press by the way. is all about Gina. It has nothing to do with the fundamentals underlying the Rhode Island ec economy. And if you look at, other than this, the literally paying for it, other than the companies that we have written huge checks and mortgaged our future for, there is no rush of business here to the state. She's relying exclusively on the failed policies of the 70s, going back to Alpha Beta, going back before that, of writing a big check and literally, in the words of Donald Nestlebush this last week, build it and they will come. Well, they have haven't. We just found out this week that there's a, a $2.2 a billion dollar need at the, at the schools. And at the same time, she's writing checks for vapor jobs. Don't you think also, Rob, and as a strategist, she spent some political capital that she didn't have. Don Kachiro, we've talked about this before. He had the station nightclub fire and some of that stuff that he built up. And then that began to erode as he went on. The truck toll rollout was horrible. The cooler and warmer was horrible. UHIP has been horrible. So she's not getting the benefit of the doubt from people who might otherwise give it to her. I think some people don't give her the benefit of the doubt, but I would again say that, that her political position, speaking as a strategist, it, she's in pretty good shape here for, for re-election. So, so I, I hear all the noise, and I'm not saying that there aren't legitimate criticisms. But that's exactly and for re-election, for let's, re but let's, re but let's look for re-election. But let's look at, that's not the only thing, but every politician cares about the re-election, and you folks are arguing that everyone in the state doesn't like her. What I'm suggesting is, is that that's just not the case if you look at the actual numbers. But here's the other thing, look at the, the truck toll thing. Maybe the rollout was horrible, but it was a pretty good idea, and she was dealing with a real well, problem. It hasn't survived it wasn't a court be, challenge yet, though. It wasn't going to be politically popular. So, so that, so so that you, gets it. You're under, what you're about seeing, the pension yeah. thing? That wasn't going to be politically popular. So, so How well was the pension plan done? Let's talk about the pension. Let's talk about the pension. Let's talk about the pension. We can talk about Pandora's box. Give me one moment. But give her her due. Those were not popular I'm going to give her her due, and then I'm going to take it away. The pension thing. So I supported Gina when she was talking about let's get these pensions under control. Control, mm -hmm. right because we still have on a local level everybody knows huge unfunded liabilities we've got massive problem in the state she hasn't Agreed. touched that since she's been treasurer but my point is simple Agreed. and I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts and the numbers of whether or not in the end those pension cuts made sense she seemed to be making sense to the average taxpayer at the time she was out working hard to get everybody to say we must make these changes. She gave the impression, maybe naively to me, that she was a numbers person, that she was logical, that she would follow something to the end result that made sense and believe it or not, even though many union folk would disagree, hit me as somewhat, just a little bit, apolitical. Who the hell is she today? She's not that person. And that's what I mean by genuineness. So it's not about tit for tat, is she good, are we better here or better there. We've had some major issues in the state that she's not taken on directly to help fix in a tangible way. All right, this is going to be continued because we could go all <laughs> morning. I appreciate the discussion. Uh, we've got a couple other things to get to, but as if we're not outraged enough, <laughs> Kate, let's go to outrages <laughs> and then we'll get back to that. You and Rob can continue afterwards. You have an outrage this So week? I've, I've kind of got a, a kudos and an outrage. 
outrage. I'd like to uh, <laughs> give a kudos to Tom Brady, who we know is the greatest of all time, and he, he was even able to overturn two calls in last weekend's game. If, if that's ever proof that we have the best quarterback <laughs> of, of ever. But the, the outrage is, again, seeing this news again, the CTE, the brain damage to these players, yes. and the lack of reception from the NFL on this issue. You know, what's Tom Brady going to be like in 10 or 15 years? And this is such a money-making industry. Again, let's, let's not forget that this is entertainment, but for these players and their families, this is their lifeblood. How's the NFL going to And the news to was that Aaron Hernandez, who died at 27 and, and showed some erratic behavior, obviously committed suicide, had the brain of a 67-year-old. That was what the, the... Oh, my God. Yeah. Shoot me now. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, exactly. but I mean, the brain of a 67-year-old, what does that mean? Well, the yeah. NFL has to, has to deal with us. Yeah. Lisa, what do you have? Sorry, that was not a nice That's thing right. I just said. Go it's ahead. just too close to my age. What do you, <laughs> what do you have for an outrage? Um... I'm going to go back to DCYF. I, I'd like to think that everybody in this state read Toby's story in the Province Journal about the eight-month-old baby who was horribly abused and has spent most of his little life in the hospital being kept alive um, on machines because the folks at DCYF decided it was best to send him home as a newborn into an environment with people that they knew were dangerous and that he would not be safe. And they said, well, it's always better to do that as long as somebody's with mom at all times. There was nobody there to be with mom at all times. DCYF is failing but miserably. But it's, it's been a fail. It, 30 years it's been a horror show. So, so I, what do you do? It has been a horror show, but when we talk about 10 deaths, 10 near deaths, what do you do? Crisis management. Then, Crisis right? management. You build up your social workers and you take a good hard look on speed on what your protocol and policies are for decision making. Okay. Pat, what do you have? I'll call it the a generational one. I'll call it the Wilfield study ignorance of basic economic realities exhibited by last week by both our leadership and by a significant part of the media. Um, as if the hearings weren't bad enough, six hours, the seven hearings. hours, <laughs> exactly. As if it wasn't embarrassing enough watching an alleged progressive like Donald Nesselbush just gloat over the prospect of giving tax breaks to millionaires. As if it wasn't bad enough watching Commerce Secretary Pryor have little or no grasp on the facts underlying the investment and pushing that off to a different meeting, despite the fact this has been part of the Rhode Island conversation for, what, three, four years now? If that wasn't bad enough. It's watching our leadership listen to nationally recognized economists, listening to experts in the field talk about the lack of any substantial ancillary development by these type of failed 1970s era you know giveaways and then going oh and by the way it'll help downtown development it won't watching the media again spend all their time handicapping whether this will pass whether Nikki Mattiello is going to come up with the bill and then spending the most of their coverage talking about how long the hearings went and what a circus they were of course uh, I want to congratulate Don Grebbian on being the newly elected head of Senate Finance. Uh, kudos to him. Um, but, 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 but what was stunning was in all the coverage, the, the absence of anything like the substitution effect, the multiplier effect, anything related to fundamental economics. It's horrific. Folks, it's time to get on our A game. If we're going to progress as an economy, if we're going to help the working poor get jobs, all the things that we all agree that we want as an end game, we simply have to do Can better. I assume we'll be hearing more from you in the coming weeks? Um, the, are, are you going to pick up your ball and go home? Mm, no. No. Pat will be there. I was watching the <laughs> hearings, and there was Pat. Yep, two hours, three hours, four hours. <laughs> oh, Mr. Ford, yes, okay. So, uh, But you were, you were on your A game. Rob, what do you have? You're batting cleanup today. That's, that's not where I batted in Little League, I have to say. <laughs> Fun there fully was intended. that year that year I went up for the camp. No, but, um, first, I just it's have good to they didn't make the a comment on Kate's then. comment, which is Tom Brady's a great quarterback, but as a Giants fan, I have to remind you about the two, those two pesky Super Bowls that he, were yeah. Eli Manning on play. Of course we do. Um, yeah, rings. <laughs> but my outrage is, is what's going on nationally with, with the health care bill. You've got the um, Republicans one more time attempting to repeal Obamacare with the, with the, with the uh, Cassidy Graham bill, which which is better than the other monstrosities, Canley. They've tried not one hearing. Speaking of um, having some numbers, as as Pat just articulately outlaid, no CBO score because it would show a bunch of people off you know, get, get, you know, not having health insurance and a bunch of other things. We're going to rush for it to get to an October first deadline, have a vote. Um, makes no sense. It's, it's one sixth of of our economy. Um, you can, if you don't like the current system, it can be fixed with some common sense fixes. Um, and then if you want to reform it over time, fine. But no, no, no sense, no plan. Um, 
a vote with no hearings, a vote with no transparency, and hopefully a vote that will fail. Okay. Uh, we have one more thing to get to. Uh, Senators Reid and White House, our own from Rhode Island, have co-sponsored mm -hmm. legislation that would move voting to the weekends instead of the uh, the Tuesday in no uh, first Tuesday in November. Uh, interesting concept. I really I don't know really how I come down on this. I think there are pros and cons. I don't know that it's actually going to become a reality. Um, well, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Senator Whitehouse. Post his infamous bill on television volume, it's good to see that he's working for the legislature again. He and believes <laughs> that this will actually cut down on global warming for some reason. I haven't figured it out yet. But. Yeah, but and, and again, this is the same guy who's invested in all sorts. Of, you know, uh, well, it's not a referendum on Sheldon White House. Talk about the talk about the. Okay. Uh, it, the it's voting. just it's just at this point the whole concept. If this is the best they have to come up with, it's just silly. What do you think about weekend voting? I think it's a good idea. It'll give, it'll make, why is it silly? It will give more people an opportunity to vote. If you do it over two days, more people vote. Presumably, you want more people to vote. If you are so willing to make an effort, sure you should vote. I'm not sure I come down either. My initial thought was, oh, now the kids don't have to lose a whole day of school. <laughs> Right? That's pragmatic. That's a good thing. Um, it might You're always for education, aren't you? I am. It might minimize school personnel and their use of co school computers for political purposes, right? S but then uh, there was an article in WPRI about this, about a 2012 Government Accountability Office report coming up with problem finding poll workers. I don't think I believe that. Securing ballots and voting equipment, don't see that that's an issue. Additional costs. I'm just wondering. Um, if we've had an updated report to determine if, in fact, it would be a significant additional cost. I would take issue with you, and, and with all due respect and a little sarcasm here, the average age of the poll worker is like 108. Exactly. So to get somebody, to get I them agree. there I two days, a problem. you gotta, maybe we need to increase the donut uh, budget. Or Make I'm, it 125 <laughs> bucks instead of 100. I mean, That's that, a non-issue. And I'm not saying right. that that should sink the whole thing, but you've got to think about the nuts and bolts of who's there at the Agreed. polls, right? Agreed. What do you okay. think there, Ms. Everybody's Nagel? looking at me. I kind of have to agree with that. You know, it's just an issue like, okay, how much time are you going to spend on this when there's so many other things to be paying attention to so I have to agree again if you know they have hearings and the numbers play out if more people are going to show up on a Saturday and instead of hey it's the weekend I'll, I'll push off voting instead of going to brunch and the movies and then all of a sudden just not hitting the polls I'd like to see those numbers but at the end of the day again what else where else is the focus but in some places they do early voting where you can do where it's yeah. you know it's not I it's mean, not a day or it's a weekend you have make it. voting more accessible and you look at the states that do it or have mail ballots there's higher turnout so if you if you yes yeah, sometimes believe double turnout so if you believe in higher <laughs> That's federal hill. If you believe most <laughs> we're Chicago. By the way, if you believe in the old days, in the old days. If you believe in if you believe as I do, that the more people that vote that that's that's better. You want to give people every opportunity to vote. I'm, you I'm like that because it's all Democrats in Rhode Island. The more people who vote, the <laughs> better for you. This is going to be national. Um, it's, and actually nationally, they help Republicans some places, Democrats in other places. But it's it's not that. Just, and the costs are minimal. And if we can't figure out, hey, get another day's worth of, we spend another X million on voting. In, uh, in a nine billion dollar budget, come on! All right. Can I, just I got a comment about that? No time. No I'm time. So left. You can make it to me afterwards. Uh, thank you for joining us, Pat and Kate. And Lisa and Rob, thank you. Uh, it's been a lively half hour again. You don't see what's going on over here. Um, thank you for joining us. Please come back here next week as a lively experiment continues. Have a great weekend, everybody. A lively experiment is generously underwritten by the Rhode Island Foundation, partnering with passionate Rhode Islanders to lead, transform, and inspire our state. Learn more at RhodeIslandFoundation.org. For 30 years, A Lively Experiment has been helping us understand the most important issues facing Rhode Islanders. Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr., and I'm proud to be a sponsor of this great program.